Uh, without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Hughes. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for giving up your time. I know you're a very busy man. Um, Dr. Mike Hughes is a consultant rheumatologist at Salford Royal Hospital and honorary senior clinical lecturer at the University of Manchester. Dr. Hughes is a leading national and international investigator in systemic sclerosis and Raynaud's phenomenon with a focus on novel clinical assessment of vascular biology and function, including the development of new novel approaches to treatment. His PhD research fellowship investigated the outcome measures of treatment efficacy, pathophysiology and local treatments for digital ulcers. He was also awarded the prestigious Edith Bush Young Investigator Award in recognition of his significant contributions during the World Scleroderma Congress in 2022. And some of you may have taken our online Raynaud's test already and Dr Hughes is one of the people uh, responsible for developing that. So. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, stop talking. So, um, thanks, Gemma. And, and thanks so much for the introduction and the, the opportunity to have this conversation. I want to share some tips and tricks uh, around self-management, but think more broadly around the diagnosis of Raynaud's and systemic sclerosis. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can we see this? Yes, perfect. So I'm going to talk about Raynaud's phenomenon and self-management, but I will touch on some other aspects as well, including drug treatment. So I think many people here in, in the audience will recognise this. These are colour changes associated with Raynaud's. We can see here on the left the pallor or the whiteness, which is very common in Raynaud's phenomenon, and involvement of the thumb, which can sometimes be a very important telltale that this may be a secondary cause of Raynaud's, and then some cyanosis or more darker appearance to the fingertips on the right. I always think it's important to remember what causes Raynaud's phenomenon. So initially we have the white kind of change and that's due to lack of blood, the blood vessels go into constriction. There can be deoxygenation, that's where the, the, the blood that's starved of tissue and there's lots of carbon dioxide is sitting there. And then eventually the fingers will reperfuse and this can happen at other places in the body as well. And we get this redness and that can be quite painful and associated with other features like tingling or numbness. And I think it's important to say that not all of these kind of changes are needed for a diagnosis of Raynaud's phenomenon, but certainly if there's a cold sensitivity or kind of change, you need to get it checked out. So we divide Raynaud's into primary Raynaud's and secondary. In primary, there's no underlying cause that we know to date. There may be genetic factors running in the family, for example, but in secondary Raynaud's, there's a potential for loss of tissue. And we can see here in picture A, there's a digital pit. In B, there's a digital ulcer, which is over, overlying one of the knuckles. And in picture C, we can see there's gangrene. So in secondary Raynaud's, by definition, there is the potential for tissue loss. So Raynaud's, as I think we all know, is very common. So most studies will say it affects around three to 5% of the population. In women, up to 20% and even 12% of men have been described. But it really depends how you look for it. We know that the vast majority of individuals will have primary Raynaud's phenomenon. It's important to recognize that around half of patients with primary Raynaud's will have a family history. And this is particularly true in women and those with early onset Raynaud's. But there is a risk of progression to secondary Raynaud's. And we can talk in the question and answer session about this later. What are the major triggers of Raynaud's? Well, exposure to cold and even very subtle changes in temperature. So patients tell me going from room to room, picking up a cold knife or fork, air conditioning, the freezer section in the supermarket. These can all be 
particular triggers, but also stress. And I, I think he, a patient told me yesterday that in, in an attack of Raynaud's, she became very stressed about how that could impact on her Raynaud's. So these are the two major triggers of Raynaud's phenomenon. We can see here uh, a study that I did uh, a few years ago where I looked at Google or internet searches for Raynaud's phenomenon. And it's really quite striking. We can see there's a clear change over the seasons, not just within the UK, but worldwide in the US as well for Raynaud's phenomenon. So it, this really benchmarks and it really highlights that cold is a, a major trigger for Raynaud's. But Raynaud's is more than just the color change, and it's a very complex symptom. And actually, it's a symptom complex. And this is work from John Pornin in Bristol, previously in Bath. And we can see that Raynaud's phenomenon is a very complex experience. And I'd really like to highlight not just the physical symptoms, but the need for adaptation over time and patients are ingenious in their ways that they manage their symptoms to prevent and to control. There's broad range in emotional impacts and triggers and exacerbating factors. There's a need for constant vigilance and self-management. They impact significantly on the activities of daily living and patients also live with great uncertainty. So as clinicians, we focus, I think, very much on the physical symptoms, but patients live with a much more broader range in constructive symptom. Indeed, if we think about primary Raynaud's phenomenon, so primary Raynaud's is where we can't identify any underlying condition like systemic sclerosis, but it still has a significant impact on quality of life and function. We can see here, this is a, a diagram of what we think is the, the patient experience of primary Raynaud's. We can see that at its heart, it is a true, what we call vasospastic condition. The blood vessels go into constriction. But there's a number of other factors as well, like cold intolerance. Patients with fibromyalgia syndrome may have symptoms of Raynaud's. Personal factors and health beliefs the impact of the cold, patients with a low body mass index or low weight, or if patients have rapidly lost weight, it's quite normal for your circulation to constrict and to protect itself if you go into the cold. So in part, it is a normal regulatory response. We wonder whether in some patients it's due to early problems with the blood vessels, and smoking causes severe vasoconstriction. And really that's one of the, one of the things that we can do for patients if, if that's a factor. This is an overview of the management of Raynaud's. So I won't talk too much today about the drug therapies, but the key thing is to establish the diagnosis. To establish that this is Raynaud's phenomenon and Patient, clinicians need to do a very comprehensive assessment, a, a physical examination. They need to take a history and order blood tests as well and perform other tests, perhaps like the capillaroscopy, and to look to see if there's any other cause. If there's an underlying cause, then this should be treated. But if there's no underlying cause, then we think initially in all patients with brain it's about general or lifestyle measures or adaptations. And this includes avoiding the cold, stopping smoking, and some patients are left for complementary therapies, which we'll discuss later. And if these are ineffective, we can see down here, we've got a whole range of different treatments in our arsenal, including drug therapies like nifedipine or sildenafil, and sometimes even surgeries required. One of the questions that patients often ask is, do they need to take treatment for Raynaud's regularly? Or could they just take it on demand? For example, if you have chest pain from angina, you can take the spray, the GTN spray. So we looked at this a number of years ago, over 400 patients from 15 countries. 
but only around half of patients reported that they could predict Raynaud's attacks and only half predicted, said they could predict the attack being either fairly, uh, fairly well or better. And unfortunately, the level of control was poor. So unfortunately, I think that when patients need to take treatment for Raynaud's phenomenon, it needs to be taken on a regular basis. And we need better treatments and we need to understand how we can measure the patient experience. Another question that I get asked is, what should we do when particularly drug treatments for Raynaud's is poorly tolerated or patients still have symptoms? And I, I'd really like to highlight here that around a third of patients in this large survey of 747 patients with systemic sclerosis Raynaud's, they'd actually look on focusing on non-drug approaches. But there were other approaches that patients would consider, including adding a new treatment, increasing the, new, increasing, uh, the dose of an existing treatment, or to switch or swap out the, the current therapy. So self-management and patient education is absolutely key in the management of Raynaud. Patients need to be provided good information and high quality information throughout the course of their disease. For example, leaflets, and there's excellent leaflets on SRUK, which we provide in our clinic, but also they're available to download. But there should be a strong multidisciplinary approach, and that includes rheumatology specialist nursing. I always talk about self-defense, and it's not just keeping the, the peripheries warm, but it's actually keeping the core warm. Because if your body temperature drops, your core drops, then the body goes into constriction and uh, it can cause a Raynaud's attack. So I think it's keeping the, the hands and the feet, but also the head, because that's a, a, a big site of temperature loss, but also keeping the core warm as well. And we can see here on the right, SRUK, fantastic information that's high, re high quality and high readability. So self-management is absolutely key. As clinicians, we can use drug therapies, but it's the self-management that's absolutely mandatory. So if we don't get that right, the, then the drug treatments are of very, very little use, if any. So many patients use hand warmers and they might, for example, use electric heated or USB powered gloves and socks. In some patients, at Raynaud's, their, their symptoms may improve over time. But particularly the, the key is for patients to be aware and, and as a clinicians that, that distinguish between primary and secondary Raynaud's. Again, if patients smoke, we should advise and, and support them in all best efforts to try and stop or at least reduce. And we need to be very vigilant and educate our patients, not just at the diagnosis, but throughout the course of their disease for the awareness of any ischemic lesions, so any ulcers or any chillblains or gangrene, because that could indicate a secondary cause and they may need a different treatment. So many patients ask me about complementary therapies and we can see a, a number of these listed here, vitamin C, vitamin E, ginkgo, biofeedback. I think in general, the, the evidence is fairly low level. But these aren't likely to be harmful. So I think that what I tell my patients is that, you know, it's important that we know and the GP knows. I usually recommend three or even six months of treatment to see if there's going to be a benefit. But I've, I've, I have had patients where complementary therapies have been helpful. But again, as below, it's important to, take, especially the primary care, the, the general, the general uh, uh, practitioner, know about these because there may be some interactions, although this is quite rare. We saw earlier that drug treatment, I'm sure many patients will be on drug therapies for their Raynaud's, 
And these are generally indicated if the general or the lifestyle medications are ineffective or not useful, or if there's an ongoing risk or current digital ulcers. So I think that early diagnosis, and we know that Raynaud's is one of the earliest symptoms of systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. We undertook, um, and this is still live on the website, the SRUK Raynaud's test. This was five questions. First of all, are your fingers sensitive to the cold? The second, looking at the response or the, the color change to temperature numbness or pain, stinging or throbbing, and then finally, any sores or ulcers. So in our initial analysis several years ago now, we included almost 20,000 patients from 43 countries, and the majority were felt to have that they may have Raynaud's, and they were given information that they could print out and take to their GP. But one fifth of patients were told that they may have Raynaud's that may be more serious, particularly with the development of digital ulcers or, or digital sores. So I think that patients are increasingly using internet based information to not only seek diagnosis, but also throughout the course of their disease. But I think then on the, the flip side, we need reliable patient education. One of my registrars, Dr. Dev Geyer, he conducted a systematic review looking at Google, Yahoo and Bing. And he showed that the overall internet-based information for Raynaud's, but also separately for systemic sclerosis was of low quality, but also inadequate readability. We can see here on the right, the PIF tick, the Patient Information Forum, and you'll see that on a number of uh, websites at the bottom. And that shows that this is a, a trusted and, and reliable base of information, not just for patients, but for clinicians as well. But we need to really work with our patients and, and clinicians need to be aware that we, we need to provide good information throughout the course of their disease. Thank you. Great, thanks. That was really interesting. Thanks, thanks Hughes. Um, we have had some questions in already, so I'm going to uh, get straight on with those. And uh, please do keep pasting those in the uh, in the Q and A section. Um, so, first question: Are COVID vaccinations known to make Raynaud's worse? Uh, my hands turned black on the evening of the first vaccination. Yeah, so it's a really, a really interesting question. I, I think we don't know. Um, so we've certainly seen in rheumatology a number of patients come to us and report that their, their rheumatological conditions either worsened or it's maybe developed in close proximity. I think it's very difficult to tell. Um, so... I, th I still think that the benefit of the COVID vaccine outweighs, outweighs the um, uh, potential risk, but there's certainly no evidence that there's a direct link, but I certainly recognise that, you know, patients have concerns about that. Yeah, exactly. So many unknowns. Thank you. Oh, the questions are coming in for the fast. Um, I have diagnosed connective tissue disease and drainodes. If my nail, fo nail folds were normal two years ago, does this mean my Raynaud's is primary? So I think that the, the, the nail fold capinaroscopy, many of the, um, the viewers would have had that done. That's where we use a microscope at the base of the nail and we look to see what the capillaries look like, look, look at the structure. So I think that if you have a diagnosis of a connective tissue disease, we would usually expect the capillaries to be abnormal, but it's not always the case. Uh, so I, you know, I think I'd, I'd speak to your, your clinician about that, but certainly the repeating the now fold capillaroscopy at sort of in, at certain intervals can be helpful. Brilliant, thank you. Um, oops. <laughs> Next question. 
So somebody has asked, I don't get the blue um, deoxygenation, just white and red. Is this still Raynaud's and is it milder if so? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question. So um, Morris Raynaud, when he described Raynaud, you know, he described other colours as well. So I think it's a, a cold sensitivity. It can be from stress as well. So we know, for example, in scleroderma, we don't necessarily see the white. It's more of the blue and actually sometimes less of the red. So most clinical trials have mandated that we have a white color change and then a second color change. So what the actual color changes tell us, I don't think we completely know. But I think that when I see patients in clinic, a patient that has a cold sensitivity, they have a, a color change from the cold, from stress, then I think that's practically, the, uh, that's the way to make a diagnosis. I think that there's a difference between clinical practice and between clinical trials. Thank you. Um, I have, so this is from Kathy. I have severe numbness and pins and needles in my fingers most mornings, which takes a good few minutes to clear. Oh, sorry. As, uh, as people put in the questions, the questions disappear. Uh, <laughs> let me just go back to Kathy. Um, is this linked to my brain? I have white fingers when an attack takes place so sorry I'll go back and say that again I have severe numbness pins and needles in my fingers most mornings which take a few minutes to clear is this linked to my ray nodes so I think that there's a few things to say there so I mean obviously the ray nodes needs checking out so I think that we know that carpal tunnel is common and certainly in carpal tunnel we do see patients get almost ray nodes like symptoms it can be an early sign of scleroderma, so I think it needs getting checking out. Uh, but I certainly recommend that, the, that she can, you know, consults her GP and thinks about things like nerve conduction studies to look for carpal tunnel or nerve problems, because that's often a, a sign of carpal tunnel. It's, it's worse in the morning and patients sort of have to shake them out. Uh, interesting ones come in. Is there any evidence that increased exposure to cold builds up resistance to cold and or decrease in Raynaud's symptoms? Yeah, so it's, uh, that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I think there is no data. I don't I don't think we know. I think that we we understand how the blood vessels constrict to, to cold and to cold exposure. I think that um, obviously patients with, with Raynaud's and, and particularly scleroderma Raynaud's, which can be very severe, they, they often avoid the cold. So it's difficult to know. So I think over time they, they limit their, their exposure to cold. But no, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any data that it actually starts to protect or, or, or change things. Yeah, there's a lot with the uh, Wim Hof method and things like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, somebody has asked, is it okay to sometimes vary the dosage of brain nodes medication according to the ambient temperature, e.g. a heat wave or travel to a hot climate? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think um, so the drug studies in the past for ray nodes, they've always used a fixed dose almost invariably. And as a rheumatologist, I treat the target. So rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, I adjust the dose. So I think that, you know, many of our patients in the spring or the summer months, they will reduce their dose or they might reduce how often they take it. Uh, you know, I think it's important that I always have this discussion and I, I document it in my letters that these are preventers. So, you know, you can't have a, you, you can't anticipate a particularly bad day and then just increase your dose. So whatever you do, there's going to be a lag time you know, seven days or something. So I think that, you know, it's okay to change the dose. You can increase it, particularly if Raynaud's is bad or if the Raynaud's is causing ulcers or, or things like this. And I think you can decrease it in the, in the more, in the more sort of, you know, warmer months, but it's not something you can just do day to day. It's something that needs to be done over weeks and months. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. 
Um, somebody just said, you mentioned acupuncture. Can you expand on this, please? Yeah, so I mean, with the with acupuncture, you know, I, I think the evidence base is quite wide. Uh, you know, it's with, with most of the complementary and uh, other therapies, the, the non sort of medical therapies, if you like, and we've not talked about surgery, and we can talk about that later as well. But I think that in general, I think these are safe. I think patients come back with a very mixed experience. Some patients find it helpful. Some patients don't. You know, but I certainly think patients need to give at least three months before they can decide whether they think it's helpful. Certainly, certainly with things like you know the the, the vitamins and the antioxidants. Great, thank you. Um, question that's come in uh, my rhinos improved during the menopause could it be influenced by hormone changes would hormone therapy be of any use so i again fantastic fantastic question i mean i think there's a few things we know that rhinos is more common in women so that tells us something or it speaks to something about hormones Certainly, we do see patients' symptoms change during the menopause. And anecdotally, I've seen when patients have received hormone replacement therapy, they've had potentially a benefit in terms of their Raynaud's. But the hormone replacement therapy itself has potential side effects. So it's not something that we'd recommend primarily for Raynaud's. But it may be that if patients are having hormone replacement therapy for another indication, you may get another benefit elsewhere from for the, for the Raynaud's. Right. And actually a question that's on a similar sort of theme. Advice, um, have you got any advice for someone suffering simultaneously from menopausal hot flashes and Raynaud's attacks in hands and feet? So I think that's incredibly difficult. So... Um, you know, I think the, one of the key things is to, to distinguish between the Raynaud's and the perimenopausal symptoms, the flushing. So in Raynaud's, the, the redness or the flushing we'd expect to be as the circulation comes back. So I'd like to get a good history that, that it's actually during a Raynaud's attack. So we need to actually make sure that we know what we're treating. There is a condition called erythromyalgia, EM. And that's almost like the complete opposite of Raynaud's phenomenon. And that's where you've actually got a heat sensitivity. It's to do with your nerves. And some patients, so erythromyalgia is one in a million, whereas Raynaud's is one in five people. So if you have both of them, that can be very challenging. And, and, and we actually often ask, you know, what's the worst? Is it the heat or the cold? But I think the, the key thing would be for to, to distinguish between is it the Raynaud's or is it the menopause that's causing the, the, the flushing? Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Anne-Louise. Are there any foods that can make Raynaud's attacks worse? <laughs> no, it's, I, I don't think so. Um, that, we, we tell patients that caffeine can be a problem a bit like smoking so it causes the blood vessels to constrict what we call vasoconstriction so i think that um that there's i'm not aware of any particular foods you know we tend to recommend a sort of mediterranean diet with, which has obviously got lots of antioxidants and things like this so yeah so no I, you know i wouldn't i wouldn't be too worried about a particular food great that's good news <laughs> something less to worry about <laughs> um Another question, as scleroderma progresses over time, does Raynaud's get worse? Yeah, so uh, that's really interesting. So, I mean, we do obviously a lot of work here in, in, into scleroderma and the blood vessels and how that changes. So I think that um, certainly there's been work that's been published that shows the Raynaud's changes over time. So in the beginning, we have these very sort of... Um, sort of oscillating attacks there's a very clear pattern but over time patients come back and they have more blue fingers and, it, and it's more fixed and that's potentially because the blood vessels are more damaged or they're more more occluded or blocked and we published recently um, a study and it was a, a, a survey of patients and there might be there might be something that tells us that you know it's a reflection that the, that the scleroderma is more severe but yeah I think over time things do change I think the fingers may become more blue but it's not not a given it's not necessary 
Um, but I think that certainly if patients develop ulcers or they develop any sores on the fingers, then that's obviously a worrying sign. And also if the Raynaud's becomes more severe on one hand than the other or the foot or the other, then it could tell us there's a problem higher up. Great. Thank you. Um, possibly sort of carrying on from that. Um, can frequent Raynaud's attacks cause permanent damage to the blood vessels of the hands and or feet? So I, I don't think we know at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, the current sort of opinion is that, it, that the Raynaud's actually causes damage. So we think it's a, a problem that comes and goes, but eventually the blood flow comes back. So I don't think that uh, it, the Raynaud's itself causes damage. Uh, whether or not that the Raynaud's causes ulcers is very unclear and, and, and probably not. So I think it's something that, that comes and goes. But it's a, a sign of an underlying problem. So certainly in scleroderma, I think the fact that you're having Raynaud's attacks, I think it tells you that you need to sort of treat the disease. It's you know it's a part of the part of the parcel. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody else has asked, what if any is the link between blood pressure and Raynaud's? So I, I'm not aware of any link. Mm -hmm. actually so I don't, i'm not aware of any link between blood pressure and uh, raynaud i think that low blood pressure particularly can be a problem so the treatments that we tend to use for raynaud's are drugs for high blood pressure or hypertension and other drugs will also drop the blood pressure so patients come in for it for what we call ionoprost or for infusions sometimes when they particularly if they have ulcers or sores so i think low blood pressure can be a problem but then on the flip side i think many of the treatments that we use for high blood pressure so people that go to their gp they get found to have high blood pressure many of the treatments like nifedipine or amylodipine these are drugs that we also use for raynaud's so it's important for that conversation between the rheumatologist, the patient, but also the primary care or general physician, the GP, to, to make sure that if we're going to pick a drug, then let's pick one that covers multiple bases. And I think at the same time, obviously, in scleroderma, a number of patients may develop pulmonary artery hypertension. So when we talk about high blood pressure, that you put a, a, a cuff on, on the arm and that measures the left side of your heart. But in scleroderma, the, the right heart pressure can go up as well. And that's why we do regular echo scans and lung function testing, the, the breathing or the blowing tests. And uh, yeah, it, I think it's important that you know, a number of the, the treatments that we use for pulmonary hypertension, we also use for Raynaud as well. Great, thank you. Um, somebody else has, has asked, will you address vascular wall thickening versus constriction? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's a, it's a really important point. So, um, so in, in Raynaud's, we have, a, we have a problem in the fact that there's an imbalance. So we have the, the blood vessel constricting and we have the blood vessel dilating and there's an imbalance. At the same time, there's in some patients a thickening of the wall. And if you imagine it like a tube or, or pipe, you know, if the pipe is thickened, there's just less room for it to go through. So I think in, in, in scleroderma, we know, for example, that the, the, the blood vessels do become thickened and that's part of the problem. Whereas in primary Raynaud's, it's more of what we say a functional problem in the fact there's a there's an imbalance between what causes it to open up and what causes it to constrict. But they're important things that we need to assess. But we've got drugs and very effective drugs that can help with both. And, and we have drugs now that can help with the, 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 the modeling or the, the thickness of the wall. Great. Wow, it's really interesting. There's so many questions coming in. So, <laughs> um, so somebody has asked, if you have Raynaud's but no other problems, is it still important to get a clinical diagnosis? 
Yeah, so I think I think Raynaud's is very common, as we said, about three to five percent of the population. I think if in doubt, get it checked out. <laughs> so you can ask your GP and you can go to SRUK and take the test and there's information you can print out for your GP. I think in, in GP areas and I think in primary care, it's not that well understood. <laughs> I think it is slight. I think it's very variable. Uh, I think if if it's severe, particularly if it's bothering patients, if it's bothering them on a day-to-day -day basis, if they're developing any sores, if they've got any puffiness to the fingers, if they've got any reflux or indigestion, these are the sort of, the, the sort of red flags, if you like. The patient should ask for an ANA or anti-nuclear antibody test, because that's a screening test. But if patients have any concern, then certainly to get referred to, to a rheumatologist. And there they'll look to do the capillaroscopy, the microscope examination. And certainly if there's any family history of scleroderma, then to, to get that checked out. And also if Raynaud's gets worse, if, if they suddenly notice their Raynaud's gets worse after years. But we're very happy to see people. Great. Thank you. Um, Jane has asked, is there any link between exercise and getting better blood flow to try to lessen symptoms long term? Yeah, so I think that exercise is very important, you know, for general cardiovascular health. There was a study that was done in Sheffield uh, before I started there, and they, they looked at the impact of cardiovascular exercise on, 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 the, on, on, the, on the function and, and cardiovascular health. And there seemed to be an improvement. So I think that it, it, it's important overall, whether or not it improves symptoms, but it may prevent progression. I think that's my take on things. Never. Probably not a bad thing to do a bit of exercise. Every now. <laughs> uh, great, thank you. Um, somebody has asked, I don't have a tap. My hands and feet are always cold um, and discoloured. They always tingle at night. Is this normal? So it's fantastic, a fantastic point. So we did a study fairly recently where only about 2% of patients could actually define a Raynaud's attack. Right. So I, I think that uh, obviously I don't know the age of the patient or their or their medical mm -hmm. condition, but I think if they you know if they're permanently cold, then they they should speak to their GP and look for any problems, make sure there's no problems with the blood vessels like atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease, and if there's tingling as well, they might want to do nerve conduction studies to see if there's any nerve problems as well. So. So it, it's it's quite atypical of Raynaud's. It, it could very well be part of it. And, and so I, I have patients where they have symptoms in between attacks. But uh, as a clinician, I want to rule out problems with the blood vessels higher up, the large blood vessels, but also the nerves as well. Great. Great question. Thanks, everyone. Um, so another question. I have been diagnosed with limited scleroderma and secondary Raynaud's. I'm currently not taking any medication and not under a rheumatologist. Should I still be having annual checks or can this be managed via a GP? So uh, no, uh, obviously, you know, scleroderma, even the limited subtype, but it's a serious condition. It needs to be respected. It needs to be monitored. So it's, we obviously the GP is the, if you like, the, the ringmaster, you know, they obviously um, are, are sort of the, the primary physician, but no, they should be having regular heart and lung checks. Mm -hmm. So as a rule, a, a transthoracic echocardiogram, which is where they put the jelly on the chest and they do the ultrasound scan, like a, a sort of like a, a, you know, baby scan and also the breathing test, the blowing test or lung function testing we do an ECG as well. So they should be done every 12 months on in general. Unless the situation changes, then sometimes they need to be done earlier. But it's not something that we expect GPs to be managing. Great. That's really useful then to know that. And, it, and the other thing is to say that many of our patients are under shared care. So they'll be under a local rheumatologist, but also a specialist centre as well. Great. 
and actually go linking slightly to this. Somebody has said, I haven't seen a GP with my Raynaud's for many years. I do get chillblains. Should I go and see my GP? <laughs> so I think chillblains and Raynaud's, uh, you know, I think chillblains are quite common. I think Raynaud's are quite common. It is very common as well. So I, I do see, Ray, I, th I think I see chillblains more often in Raynaud's than not. <laughs> Uh, so I think that if it's a problem and if it's something that they're concerned about, they should get it checked out, particularly if the, the Raynaud's has got worse. So they're having more attacks or it's become more painful. And particularly even the chillblains themselves, they can be an absolute nuisance. So if the chillblains are breaking down or ulcerating, they should get that looked into. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't carry on suffering. Exactly. Um, Great. Uh, somebody also has asked, can taking beta blockers exacerbate Raynaud's? So it's quite, um, it's quite controversial. So um, <laughs> beta blockers are drugs that we use for heart problems, things like atenolol or propanolol. And the idea has always been that they could cause you, you your Raynaud symptoms to either develop, they could cause Raynaud's or worsen. So I think the jury nowadays is more out. <laughs> so I don't think it's clear. Uh, and I have many GPs and cardiologists write to me about that. So whether they should stop it or, or whether they should decrease the dose. And so it's just not clear. So I think that they're often used for heart failure. So I think heart failure is obviously an enormous problem. It's a, a major problem. So, I mean, I think that that takes the priority, the heart. But if there's an option of another drug, and, and particularly if the symptoms have come on or they've worsened after starting the beta blocker, then we need to have a close discussion between the cardiologist and the rheumatologist. Great. And actually, someone's uh, followed on with a question about chillblains. Uh, can you recommend any cream or ointment? <laughs> so, not particularly. So, um, defer to sort of dermatologists and and to GP. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think that the the key thing with chillblains treat them early. So, I think they're often very itchy to begin with. So, I think topical steroids and things like this. The key thing is to get in early. Yeah. Thank you. But I think that the other thing to say is that some of the drugs that, that we use for uh, for Raynaud's have been shown to be beneficial for chillblains, prevent chillblains. Right? Great. Yeah. Um, Leona has asked, why are my hands and feet swollen with Raynaud's? So <laughs> it's difficult. I mean, whether it's swollen all the time or whether it mm -hmm. comes and goes, but there's a number of possibilities. I mean, I think the first is that as the blood comes back, it, it, the blood, you know, the circulation opens up and there's a lot of fluid that, that sort of goes into the tissue. The second is sometimes patients with Raynaud's, they might have another autoimmune problem they, or, or they may have an autoimmune problem like rheumatoid arthritis as well. And in scleroderma or, or systemic sclerosis, we often see very puffy hands and puffy fingers. So that's one of the, the earliest features of what we call the very early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. It's these puffy fingers. So there's a number of potential reasons, not, not all of them listed there, but um, I think it's worth getting that checked out. Great, thank you. Question just coming from Christine. She says, my GP says the only real option is to keep warm and medication is a concern due to an un underlying circulation disorder. Can you recommend anything further for self-management? So I think, uh, as we said before, it's self-defense. It's obviously keeping warm. It's not just the peripheries. It's the, the, the head as well. It's keeping the core warm and making sure that's um, protected but it's also things like layering so i talked to mm -hmm. patients about layering which i should have said earlier but you know it's better to have one it's better to have two layers than one layer because you've got the air in between it's almost like insulation mm -hmm. it's being aware of your environment and, and again you know patients even pick up a cold knife and fork or the steering wheel in the morning when they go to the car these are all being aware of your surroundings and the potential triggers 
But no, certainly, um, you know, drug treatment. So primary Raynaud's can be just as severe as secondary Raynaud's in terms of the impact for patients. So, uh, you know, drug treatment is certainly something to consider. Thank you. And actually, uh, linking to the uh, prevention being better than cure. Um, uh, this person has said, I always wear handmade woolly socks and lots of cashmere wool fingerless gloves. Sometimes um, my toes and fingers get cold despite my best efforts. What is the best way to warm up frozen toes? I'm currently using the hairdryer. So. <laughs> well, very, uh, well, I think it's very personal. So, you know, some people will run their fingers and toes over the, uh, under a sort of hot tap, you know, not too hot to scald themselves. Some people will sort of spin them around like a windmill. Some people put them under the arms. So there's lots of different ways. Um, but the main thing is not to do yourself any damage, you know, particularly sort of too, too hot water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And with energy prices, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody else has asked, could there be a link between having celiac disease and Raynaud's? So I don't think directly. Um, celiac disease, obviously an autoimmune disease affecting the bowel. And we, we do see that if you have one autoimmune disease, you're probably more likely to have another one by mm -hmm. chance. You know, these are almost like buses. They tend to run together. <laughs> So I think that if you have seen that disease, that obviously, you know, you're more likely to have an undying connective tissue disease or an undying autoimmune disease. So I don't think directly there's any link, but it, it might give it might give an indication there might be something else that's causing the Raynaud. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, question from Robert. Is Botox an option or is it better than sildenafil? Um, did I pronounce that right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we were going to talk about um, uh, uh, surgery, weren't we? Mm, so, yes. So surgery is sometimes indicated or sometimes an option for Raynaud's. So there's a, we work very closely with our hand surgeons here. So I think that there's a number, of, a number of reasons why. One, you might have a blockage higher up, particularly if your symptoms are worse on one hand or feet. You might have ulcers, you might have gangrene. And if that's the case, they might need tidying up a wee bit. But yeah, certainly Botox, they can do that at the, the level of the knuckle and that will help to open up the circulation. That's quite variable, I think. Some patients, it helps and it can last up to three months. It's often a stopgap measure. So particularly if, if they've, I've got a patient at the moment who needs heart surgery and, and he can't have any other treatments, so this will just sort of tide him over, particularly over the winter months. But I think some patients that there's no benefit. But the idea is that you're opening, it paralyzes a bit like if you do it around the, the, the eye or that, it paralyzes the muscle. So the, the blood vessel opens up. So it can be very helpful. Often and often we, we combine that in certain patients, particularly with scleroderma, with what we call sympathectomy, where the nerves are actually physically cut to the fingers. So that's a much more permanent result. It's a much more invasive procedure. The Botox can be done in outpatient, just with some low right. anesthetic. Right. So it's so Botox, I think, is quite variable. It, it can last up to three months or so. Uh, but it's often a bit of a stopgap measure. It's not something that we really you can look, you need to be thinking about the, the treatment underneath things like the sildenafil. So if you're needing to do Botox regularly, then you, you're not winning. Right. And actually some people have asked about some of the treatments like acupuncture and with Botox. Are they, they are available on the NHS, are they? Or? So the Botox is, mm -hmm. so for, but it depends on the individual centre. Um, mm -hmm. Acupuncture for Raynaud's, I don't think is. No. Right. Thank you. And actually, we've had a few people asking about vitamin B3 and whether that's helpful. So I'm not aware of any particular evidence for vitamin B3. I, I'm quite open about these things. I, I think it's unlikely to be harmful. But it, again, it's letting the GP know that they're, they're on the treatment. And I think realistically, they probably need at least three, maybe even six months treatment to actually see if it works. 
but the, the, this idea of antioxidants and, and different therapies being helpful. Great, thank you. We'll have, we've got time for probably a couple more. Um, Katrina has said, my nose often gets cold too. Have you heard that before? Yeah, very much. So I always ask patients about um, the fingers, but particularly the thumbs. Mm -hmm. So in secondary raynodes, the thumb tends to be affected. Mm -hmm. So in secondary raynodes, the thumb has a separate blood supply to the rest of the fingers. It's actually closer to the body, so it's actually protected. And actually, there's a length. If, it, if the blood can't get to here, there's a problem. So actually, thumb involvement as a, as a rule of thumb, no pun intended, is, is, <laughs> is, is, is always worrying. But you can have thumb involvement in primary. It's not, not impossible by any means. But yeah, I, I always ask patients about nose, ears and lips. And it can affect the more sensitive areas as well. For example, women, if they're breastfeeding, they can have problems because baby can't latch on. Uh, right, yeah. Interesting, thank you. Um, so actually some, somebody has said, do many people have attacks on their tongue? Yeah, so not not commonly, but mm -hmm. certainly, um, it, it, you know, it, it's well known. So you can have it. Um, I think if patients are worried, particularly if they've got sort of blue lips and, the, for example, they've got chest pain, then they should get that checked out. But mm -hmm. yeah, so certainly isolated tongue involvement you can have. Uh, but it's much less, you know, the hands are really the, the primary site. So, you can get it, so I think if you're ever worried about that, then just get it checked out. Quite probably this one might be maybe the last one. Is there a link with asthma and Raynaud's? So not, not that I'm aware. Um, and certainly the sort of inhaled drugs that, pe that patients use, they're unlikely to reach the circulation to a level that could cause any Raynaud's. So I think, again, Raynaud's very common, 5% of the population, if not more, depending how you look for it, and asthma is very common as well. So I think that, that, that it's probably just by chance the patients have this. Great. Um, we have had somebody ask um, about whether eating could trigger a Raynaud's attack, and that they've said the cutlery isn't cold. Right. Um, but yes, they seem to have Raynaud's attacks when they eat food. So it's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So um, I think that there's a number, I, I mean, I don't know. No. <laughs> in in Raynaud's and, and uh, certainly in scleroderma, there's this problem called autonomic dysfunction. It's to do with your nervous system. It's, it's not working properly. So potentially that could stimulate an attack. And then the other thing is obviously taking sort of cold foods and things like that. But like, yeah, I've, I've, I've not heard that personally, but certainly would recommend at least seeing a GP if that's a concern. Yeah, great, thank you. Do you think we have uh, time for one yeah. more? Okay, great, Rachel said she has a slightly low BMI. Would putting on weight help to reduce the frequency of rain over time? So I think, it, um, Rachel, I think if it's slightly low, then I, you know, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't necessarily do anything just for that. We know that in, in patients where they have a very low BMI, you know, very, very un, unhealthy BMI almost, then there is an association with Raynaud's. And certainly I've seen patients where they've undergone very rapid weight loss or they've had, for example, bariatric surgery where they've developed Raynaud's. And if we think back to the slide earlier, I think that, uh, you know, low BMI or sudden loss of weight can trigger things. Uh, but uh, I think if it's only slightly low, then I, I, I concentrate on these other factors. Great. Brilliant, thank you. We've had a lot of people saying thank you. It's been really interesting. People saying thank you once you've answered their questions because they've been looking for that answer for a long time. So, uh, and actually we had a um, really nice comment from someone called Gio who has said they can recommend wearing uh, wicking clothing as base layers because they draw 
the moisture away whilst keeping you warm, um, but has also said they have secondary rain aids and this webinar has been incredible. Um, I've been welling up at times, smiling at others and nodding like the Churchill dog. So thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> it's always lovely to hear feedback like that. So thank you and thanks so much for your time. We have had a couple of questions on calcinosis and in fact, that leads nicely to- To the next uh, webinar. Yes, yeah. exactly. On the 27th of February with uh, Dr. Arian Herrick, uh, so please, you'll get um, an email following up from this um, webinar, but with a link to that. But also do keep an eye on our social media because there's always lots of interesting information on there as well. So that's brilliant. And thank you so much. Dr. Hughes. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we uh, let everyone go? <laughs> well, thanks, Gemma. And, um, you know, I just want to say there's so much work that's going on at the moment. And SRUK is such a, a strong supporter of that. Uh, there's a, a, a digital also unmet need survey that's live at the moment. You can find it on yes. SRK. So um, we want to shape the future of new digital also work. Um, but no, so, thanks so much. And, um, you know, very happy to follow up with any 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 extra messages. Great. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thanks for your attention, everyone. And uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. <laughs> thanks very much. Bye. Bye bye.